Good morning to you all. Boy, what is it, 39 degrees? That sure beats the six degrees yesterday. Man, was that cold. So things are warming up, things are looking up, and thank you for being here this morning. And let's open with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for those that are in attendance today, Lord. May we just have a blessing uh, for us in this early service, Lord. Be with us as we open the Word of God together. Let us have understanding. Let us have guidance, Lord, and we'll give you all the honor and praise for giving us these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first song is number 259. The, the song was called, Are You Washed in the Blood? A very good question. Number 259, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in this grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white, in the blood of the Lamb? Will your souls be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite Mrs. Linda Campbell to the pulpit to lead us in our unison reading as the rest of us stand, please. This unison reading comes from Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45. It is part of the Sermon on the Plain, which we've been talking about in recent weeks, Miss Linda. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to have Mrs. Campbell back in the pulpit. I should let you preach today. <laughs> 
Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you a hypocrite. By definition, the confession I just made means that my actions sometimes run contrary to my stated beliefs. In church layman's terms, I am admitting to you that I do not always practice what I preach. And I would be embarrassed beyond mending if it were publicly revealed how often I do not practice what I preach. I preach for all of you to pray, yet I am weak in my own prayer time. I preach for all of you to read your Bibles, yet I struggle to find time to read mine. I preach for all of you to abstain from sin, yet I stand before you a sinner. In my defense, I mean to practice everything I preach. I, I plan to, but very often I fall short. However, I have some very alarming news for you this morning. I am in good company. I truly mean no offense when I say that we are all a bunch of hypocrites. You ride alongside with me. Anyone who does not live how they think others should live 100% of the time is a hypocrite. Even if you only mess up once, you are still that one time a hypocrite. It's so easy, isn't it? It's almost human nature to live other people's lives for them. It's so easy to recognize and rebuke the faults we find in others, yet ignore the very same faults we have in ourselves. It's so easy for us to judge the splinters in the eyes of others, ignoring the beam sticking out of our own eyes. But by definition, there are two types of hypocrites. And there is a rift between the two and a difference between the two. On one side, there is us, well, hopefully us, we, who try to live by the standards we judge others. And then there are those who mockingly impose rules upon others which they have no intentions of ever living by those same rules themselves. The second type, type in the Bible are often called apostates and and false teachers and heretics. Let me, give you that, let me give you that again. We are all hypocrites. But there are those who struggle not to be so. There are those who try to live lives that are consistent and honoring. There are those, but then there are those who are, who are purposely hypocrites. And I suppose if you're going to be a hypocrite, and we are going to be hypocrites, hopefully we fit into the first group where we're trying our best not to, but the one thing in both types that we have in common, those who try not to be hypocritical and those who are, who, who, who try to, who intentionally are hypocritical, we both have in common that we need to repent from our sin. Repentance is very important. In his Sermon on the Plain, Jesus has, a very, has some very, a very wise caution about hypocrites, the intentional kind. And to set this up, Jesus first talks about two types of trees. In Luke 6, 43, we just read this a little bit ago. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Jesus often uses comparisons to help us better understand, and here he compares mankind to trees. If a tree is healthy, it will more than likely bear healthy fruit. But if a tree is sickly, it will bear sickly fruit 100% of the time. Such is us. A wholesome good person will perform wholesome good deeds, and a shady evil person will perform shady evil deeds. The problem is, at first glance, it's not always easy to tell a good tree from a corrupt tree, and this is true. When trees are pruned back, it's hard to tell the good from the bad. Fortunately, we have the taste of the tree's fruits to help us make that determination. As Starr often says, we're fruit inspectors. I like to, I'm a fruit taster, maybe. It's hard to judge trees unless we have their fruits to judge them by. Now, I know what you're thinking, judge? Pastor, you just used the wicked word judge. Isn't one of the things Jesus tells us not to do is to judge others? Well, yes, you are correct. Jesus not only tells us to Judge not, he does so during the very passage we're teaching out of this morning, the Sermon on the Plain. In Luke 6, 37, just a mere six verses before today's unison reading, Jesus commands us to judge not. But if we're going to quote Jesus, let's do that. Let's do so in its entirety. The verse says, judge not and ye shall not be judged. 
Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgiven, ye shall be forgiven. Given, it shall be given unto you. First, I believe Jesus' command for us to judge not is a call back to the golden rule that he gives us in verse 27. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. We often say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, if we're going to judge others, then we need to be prepared to be judged ourselves. If I judge somebody for smelling, <laughs> for having a stench about them, I better make sure my armpits are clean. I better make sure, or I'm going to go, who's he to talk about so-and-so smelling when he... Anyway, that was a bad example. That, that's not, that wasn't even in my notes. I just couldn't think of a good example. But if I, uh, if I uh, call somebody cheap and, and like they, 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 they won't spend a dime and they're cheap or whatever, and then I'm pinching pennies and I'm stealing sugar packets from McDonald's, well, you know, who am I? So if I'm going to judge someone, they, I'm going to be judged back by the same standard. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us so in the same passage, for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. In other, other words, the same standard we hold to others will be held to us. This is more of a lesson of judging the splinter in our brother's eye when we have a beam sticking out of our own eye. It's more, more of that. Second, the word judge has various meanings, two of which are discernment and condemnation. It is not for us to condemn anyone. In that respect, only God may judge. Only God may condemn. But when I say that we are to judge others by their fruits, I'm talking about having discernment. We are to be wise. We are commanded to pray for understanding and to do the right thing. When good, what good is it for us to pray for wisdom and understanding if we're not going to use it? When we realize that a man is bearing rotten fruit and only rotten fruit, it's not just a mistake he's made. If, he, if he's rotten to the core, he's most likely a false prophet, someone who we can't trust, and we need to distance ourselves from him. I know, it's like walking a tightrope, isn't it? Sometimes Christianity seems like a tightrope. But let me put it this way. We are to judge or recognize evil in men, but it's only for God to judge or condemn them for their evil deeds. There's a difference in the two meanings of judge. Luke 6, tells us, For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of bramble bush gather they grapes. Just as we know a fig tree by its figs and a grapevine by its grapes, we recognize a hypocrite by the hypocrite hypocritical deeds they perform. I am a hypocrite. I admit that to you. If I may be again so bold, so are the rest of you, but that's not who we're talking about today. We're trying to do right. We're trying to live, uh, we're trying to be sinless. We're, we're trying to do what's right in the, the eyes of God. Even the healthiest tree can occasionally bear a bad apple or two, but a bad tree, a corrupt tree can never bear a good apple. It may look like a good apple. It may seem, okay, that looks like a good apple. But when you taste it, uh, it's sour, it's rotten, it's corrupt. If a man's heart is evil, he can do nothing but evil in God's eyes. Oh, his deeds at first glance may seem good to us. But what do we know? We're dumb. <laughs> his deeds may fool us at first. But God sees the hearts of men. God sees my hearts. He knows if I'm being sincere. He sees your hearts as well. But more sooner than later, a man with an evil heart will reveal himself to be evil for all to see. All right, the next song is number 109, Whiter Than Snow. Page number 109. Whiter Than Snow. No, Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, look down from your throne in the skies and help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself and whatever I know. Now wash me and I shall be 
whiter than snow, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing I see your blood flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, you see as I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Last week, we started a short sermon series on fear. As you recall, last Sunday, we learned how the disciples are in a boat with Jesus asleep on the deck and a fierce wind suddenly arises, putting the disciples into a panic. In their fear, they wake up Jesus, the Son of God, with a, with a little vinegar in their voices, and they ask him, Master, carest not thou we perish? Jesus stands up and declares, Peace be still, and the storm quickly subsides. But Jesus is not done speaking. He then turns to his disciples and asks of them, Why are ye so afraid? How is it that you have no faith? That was just a quick review. If you want to watch the whole sermon, it was posted very early this morning on our church's YouTube and Facebook pages. Anyhow, last week we had an example of how not to handle our fear. The disciples forgot they were in the presence of the Son of God, and fear makes us forgetful to that fact. This week we're going to have an example of how we're supposed to handle our fear. And for this we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let me set up the story. God has chosen a little shepherd boy named David to be the future king of Israel. But the Israelites are impatient. They get ahead of God. They want a king before God was ready to give them one. So they chose for themselves a popular, very flawed man named Saul. He was tall and handsome, and that's why they chose him. God allows this. God gives the people, if that's what they want, they can have it. David will just have to wait his turn to be king. So how is this little shepherd boy ever going to grow up to be the mighty king of Israel ahead of Saul's own children? You know how uh, royal hierarchy works. The, the king dies. One of the sons or one of the daughters takes the throne. Well, David's not related. How is David going to be the next king when he's not related to Saul? Well, one step at a time. An evil spirit vexes King Saul. And the only thing that brings Saul any relief from his torment is music. So Saul commands that a harpist be brought to live with him in the palace. Then any time Saul is tormented, day or night, he will call for the harpist to play soothing music and calm the king down. Well, what do you know? That little shepherd boy, David, knows how to play the harp. And I guess he works cheap. I don't know. <laughs> so David is drafted. Little David then lives in the king's house, and the king becomes very reliant on him to get him in a good mood. Doesn't God work in mysterious ways? In one instant... This little undeserving, unknown, unrelated shepherd boy has access to the king. And in the in the time, and in time he becomes the king's right hand man, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Our story continues. Sometime after young David becomes the royal harpist, the mighty dreaded Philistines declare war against Israel. The Philistines camp out on one mountain, while the Israelites make their camp on the opposing mountain, and there's a valley in between them. The Philistines have the upper hand in this battle. They have a not-so-secret weapon, a giant named Goliath. 
Having Goliath on their side is probably why they were so confident in declaring war against the, against the Israelites in the first place. Goliath is a champion on the battlefield. He is six cubits and a span tall, which I'm told is over nine feet. Goliath wears a heavy uh, helmet of heavy brass. He wears a brass armor to protect his legs and an arm coat of heavy mail to protect the rest of him. We're told this all weighs about 125 pounds. A soldier always walks in front of Goliath carrying a big shield. Goliath is basically a human tank. He carries a bronze sword strapped upon his back and a spear which has an iron spearhead which weighs more than 15 pounds. Goliath also has a big booming voice, loud enough to be heard from the mountain the Philistines occupy all the way to the mountain that the Israelites are camped upon. Goliath shouts a deal across uh, the valley to the Israelites. He basically proposes, hey, hey, why should your army go to the trouble of dying at the hands of the mighty Philistines? Instead of all of you going into the battle to die, just choose from among you one fighter, one soldier, your best fighter, and I and this soldier will combat, we will, go into, uh, we, we will fight, and win or take all. You know, this is thousands of years ago. I don't know. Why, why don't we solve wars that way? Because Biden is a weak old man. That's why he, he would be no match for anyone. Anyway. Goliath continues. If your champion wins, we Philistines will become the servants of Israel. Ah, but if you lose, you Israelites will become the servants of the Philistines. When King Saul hears Goliath's taunt, he is greatly troubled. None of his soldiers alone are a match for this nine-foot champion. Goliath's taunt also causes the Israelites to lose what little self-confidence they have left. Goliath is basically calling them all cowards. He knows none of them are going to step forward. And the longer they wait to agree to Goliath's deal, the more cowardly they appear. It's all a big joke. Meanwhile, while King Saul was tending to do his problems on the battlefield, David, who is probably a, a young teenager by now, is left home alone behind at the palace. David is too young to fight, and there's really no need for harp music on the battlefield. So David makes use of his free time, and he leaves the king's house, the palace, and he goes to visit his father, Jesse. And he thinks, I'm going to go, you know, he used to be a shepherd boy. I'm sure uh, my father needs help with the sheep, especially since my three older brothers, Eliab, Abimadab, and Shammah are off help fighting King Saul on the battlefield. Help, fighting, help King Saul fight on the battlefield, I'm sorry. Although Jesse is very glad to see his son David, David's visit cannot calm Jesse's heart. Jesse is worried about his oldest three sons on the battlefield. They have been fighting these Philistines on and off again for 40 long days. Jesse's heard no word. So Jesse tells David to go visit his brothers at their campsite and to take them some food. Jesse packs David's carriage with bread, corn, and cheese for Eliab, Abimadab, and Shema and their captain. And I'm sure I'm butchering those names. Anyway, David is to deliver the food and then come straight home and tell his father, Jesse, how the boys are doing. Upon arriving on the, on the battlefield, David hears Goliath once again daring any one of the Israelite soldiers to face him. David sees how afraid his brothers and the other soldiers are. David also learns how King Saul, get this, has agreed to award any of his men who could defeat Goliath, he's going to give them great riches in the hand of his daughter. This marriage into Saul's family will make this soldier a prince of the royal family. Thinking this is, well, that's a pretty sweet deal. And not wanting Goliath to, to make the soldiers look foolish, David speaks up to his brothers. He says, hey guys, what, what, what are you waiting for? That's a pretty sweet deal. You're going to be prince, you're going to be a rich, and his daughter's not so bad looking. You're not scared, are you? One of you, quick, get out there and kill Goliath. Get this thing over with. What are you waiting for? Don't forget, God is on our side. Eliab, David's oldest brother, gets very angry at his baby brother. Why are you here? This is none of your business. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. You are too young to be here. You just came to put your nose in our business. Now go home. David replies to Eliab, I'm not done. What have I done now? Why are you so mad at me? But Eliab is not the only one mad at David. 
All the soldiers think that he's in the way and he needs to go home. They are embarrassed enough without this young teenage know-it-all shaming them and, and goading them into a fight which they know they can't win. So David goes to, sing king, goes to see King Saul. As the royal harpist, David has access to the king. David says to Saul, don't worry that none of your men want to face Goliath. I will fight him. I will gladly fight him. After all, God is on our side. Humoring young David, Saul replies, that's cute. <laughs> it's noble of you to volunteer, but face facts. There's no way you'll be able to face off Goliath, the Philistines. You are young and you have no combat experience. Goliath is huge and he's been a soldier since he was a kid. David then tells the king some incredible facts about himself. David then reveals that once while he was watching his father's sheep, a lion snuck up and put a little lamb in the lion's mouth. David fought off the lion and killed it, rescuing the lamb. On another occasion, a bear attacked his flock, and David alone fought off the bear with his bare hands. David then declares, I promise you, dear king, the Philistine Goliath will suffer the same fate as that lion and that bear. I know this because I have the mightiest of weapons with me. I have the Lord. When I faced off with that bear and that lion, the Lord is on my side. I am not afraid. The Lord delivered me victoriously from danger before, and he will do so again today. Maybe the king believed David. Maybe he was very convincing. Or maybe because the king had no other options, Saul gives David his blessing and permission to face off the mighty Goliath. Saul, goes, Saul says, so go and, and the Lord be with thee. Saul then has David dressed in his own royal armor, but the battle gear is too heavy for David to maneuver. So David dumps off the armor and he goes to face Goliath in just his everyday clothes. Instead of heavy weaponry, David chooses, chooses for himself five smooth stones from the brook and he also takes with him his sling. When David steps up in front of the other men and faces off Goliath, Goliath can't believe his eyes. You can almost hear big old Goliath say, Fee, fi, fo, fum. He's a giant compared to this little squirt. There is no way that of all the Israelite soldiers, King Saul would send this, this small, ruddy, fair little boy. He's the one who's going to do battle with, with me, mighty Goliath. Goliath responds, what is this? Is this the best you've got? I'm not a dog you can fight off with sticks. Goliath then laughs and curses God, which was a mistake. God swears by, Goliath swears by his false gods. When I get done with you, little boy, you will be a mere snack for the birds and the animals to feast upon. David then tells Goliath, you're coming to battle with me with, oh, you're coming to battle me with only a sword and a spear, but I have a weapon more mighty than you. I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you were just making fun of. The Lord will have me kill you and cut off your head, and it won't be my body the birds and the animals will be pecking at. It will be yours. That's pretty good smack talk for a little kid, right? And this will all be done so that you Philistines and all the other heathen nations will finally grasp through their thick skulls that the God of Israel is the true and only one God. Well, these words of... David angers Goliath. He rises up to, to throw the first blow, but David runs toward him, puts a stone in his sling, and whips it at Goliath's head. Now, I know it wasn't a sling like this. It was more like a yeah, 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 sling. But I didn't have that. I don't have one of those. The stone sticks in Goliath's forehead, and Goliath, the mighty Philistine giant, falls down hard upon the ground. David then runs up and stands on top of Goliath. He takes a sword, Goliath's sword, and he cuts Goliath's head off. And when the Philistine soldiers see that their mighty champion is dead, they run away like cowards. They retreat. Seeing the Philistine soldiers retreat, the Israelite soldiers shout their battle cries and they pursue after them. They kill and wound all the Philistines and destroy the camp. The, the Israelites win the battle. God gives them the victory. And Saul keeps his promise. Since David killed Goliath, Saul makes David a very rich man. David also wins the hand of the king's daughter, but he gets the rest of her after he grows up a little bit. What can we learn from this story? 
The story teaches us that God is mightier than the mightiest armies. And with God, nothing is impossible and there's no reason to fear. But keeping with our theme, David should have been afraid, but he wasn't. And we might, some might say, well, that's because he was young and foolish. He was too young and stupid to know he was in real danger. But that's not what we know. David tells us himself the reason he was brave is because God was with David. And David didn't forget that like the disciples did last week in our, in our sermon last week. David was not afraid because David did not forget that God was with him. This true story of the shepherd boy turned harpist, turned into giant, turned giant killer, is the ultimate example of how we godly people are to face our fears. If God is, be, if God is before us, who can be against us? With that, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Bob Burke to the pulpit to lead us in our responsive reading. It is a communion reading from the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 22 through 24, and please stand. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread. And blessed it and break it and gave it to them. And said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given the thanks. He gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Amen. And you may be seated. Let's turn to page number 560. We'll sing the one verse of blessed be the tie that binds then we'll be closed with the Lord's prayer. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. And to lead us in the Lord's Prayer, I'm going to invite Mr. Cody Frick to the pulpit. And I hope you have a wonderful day ahead. It looks like it's going to be a nice day, a sunny day for February. Brother Cody, if you'd come forward at this time. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for coming to this